All right, everybody, welcome back to the Forward Podcast. I know, I know it's been a minute. I've been slacking. Um, but my guest today, Dr. Rick Doblin, is somebody that, and Rick, you don't know this, but I, I've been following your story for for many, many years. And I and I want to get into why this conversation has been on my mind for, for years now. Um, it, and just a, a spoiler alert, I mean, it really has to do with, with tenacity and perseverance and endurance. I mean, you have... Yeah. Um, you have uh, lasted the test of time, um, but it's a fascinating story. And so I've been, you, 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 I know we talked earlier about some mutual friends we have. You haven't known this, but I have been such an admirer of yours um, oh. over the years. And so I'm super excited to, uh, to talk about your, your, uh, your great work, uh, in my view, and, and certainly controversial work uh, in some others' view. But uh, I've really admired uh, your path. And it's it's just great to be here. Uh, just for the listener and and viewer at home, um, Dr. Doblin founded what, uh, and we can all look this up and and send it out to folks. But his organization is called MAPS. That stands for the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, which we all know how that uh, um, sort of resonates in in people's uh, in a lot of people's minds. Um, but the work is, is just wildly important. But before we get into the work, I want to have a little fun if, if, if yeah. I can, Rick, oh, uh, I, was, it, I, I was talking to our mutual friend earlier and, <clears throat> and in all my research, I never, I, I, I couldn't come across this story. And so I thought, well, hell, I'll just, I'll ask him about it. And so our, our friend was telling me, you got to ask him about how, when he was in college and the, 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 he saw a sign or a brochure or something about the, the this idea of adopting a wolf pup. Oh gosh, that's a great story. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> well, and I, I just, you know, I'm not sure that I would have fallen for that. So I have to hear what your logic was oh. uh, in adopting a wolf pup. Wow. Um, well, I love this story. So, you know, I have learned an enormous amount in my life from psychedelics, but some of the most important lessons I've ever got were from raising a wolf. And from really spending uh, two years, I had them for two years. Um, and it was when I was 21 years old. So this was quite a long time ago. So from 21 to 23. And my, um, my mother, as I was growing up, she didn't like us to have any pets or anything because, oh, dogs would shed and this and that. So we, we never really had any um, pets at, at, at home. And when I was 21, I was approaching my birthday and I thought, you know, I'd like to get a dog. I thought that would be really good. And I wanted a big dog, like a German Shepherd or, or something like that. And um, I saw a great Dane puppy and I thought, oh, that's going to get too big. And, um, and then a friend of mine said that she had seen an ad in the paper for wolf cubs and it was from the Humane Society. So to say I, I was living in Sarasota, Florida, which was the home of the Ringling Brothers Circus, the winter home. And there was all sorts of... Um, carnivals and circuses and wild animal breeders. And one of them was not taking care of the animals and the humane society shut them down. Hmm. And the female wolf was pregnant. So it was a purebred Alaskan timber wolf in Florida. And at the time the zoos were full, the sanctuaries were full. They were being um, hunted down in the wild. You can't reintroduce them into the wild. So they didn't know what to do with these, uh, a litter of eight wolf cubs. And so I was kind of shy and um, insecure, I guess, uh, at, at that stage. And so I thought, God, a wolf, I could probably learn a lot of lessons in confidence and in courage <laughs> and in uh, being the apex predator and all of this. And I also knew enough that wolves are not, they're, they're a lot like psychedelic drugs or drugs in general, where we load our fears onto them. Mm -hmm. So they're like drugs are scapegoats, wolves are scapegoats. We're all told about Little Red Riding Hood and you know, wolves are terrible, but they don't actually attack people. You know, lions and tigers attack people. Wolves don't attack people. They have incredible social structures. They're, they're very loving animals. And they have this, you know, incredible wild independent spirit that, you know, from which we've got all these dogs. So I thought, okay, I'll ask for the most uh, dominant of the litter. And I thought <laughs> that I could get some confidence from them. Also, wolves are born with their eyes closed. And it takes them a little bit of time to open their eyes. And so they were taken away from their mother and bottle fed so that they open their eyes on people. Hmm. So this, this is an unusual group of wolves that really identified in certain ways with humans. And so the, the most dominant of the litter was this male. 
And I was reading this book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, sure, which is a tremendous book. And the alter ego of the person um, who's writing the book or, or the part of him that was um, focused on obsessive, focused on quality and then went crazy. He called that part of himself Phaedrus. And he said that Phaedrus was the Greek word for wolf. And Phaedrus is the, the character in the Plato dialogues. Phaedrus is a guy from the country who comes into the city and, and it's about the taming power of love, mm. sort of this kind of dialogue on love with Plato and Phaedrus. So I named him Phaedrus and I had um, this incredible experience that I was, I, I, I built a house when I was 21 and I, um, it was at the edge of town and it was, you know, literally railroad tracks. And that was the edge of town. And on the other side of the tracks was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres of um, empty land. And so I could take the wolf roaming off the leash through the, through the woods and um, there were little ponds we could go swimming in. And, and so I used to wrestle with him and, you know, he would try to push me down. I tried to push him down. He, but one of the, the most important things that I, I learned from him was this, the way that he traveled through nature hmm. and, you know, and the way that we travel through the world. And so he had this, you know, abundance of energy and when there would be a hill, he would just go over it, or there would be a ditch, he would go through it, or there would be a bush, he would run through it. You know, so he had this kind of straight ahead um, attitude. Mm -hmm. And then these are opportunities for exercise rather than let's look at the least uh, uh, energetic way to do something. So when we're in big cities or even small cities everywhere, there's always sidewalks that channel us around a little ditch or we're, we're, we're channeled in certain ways that are not necessarily the most direct way. And so a lot of times when I walk off the beaten path, which I do most every day when I'm out in the world somewhere, I think about the wolf. And th the other part is that there was a lot of um, dogs that wouldn't play with him. You know, there was just um, very few but, but he was incredibly loving and very independent. And um, I learned an awful lot from him. We howled together. We ran together. Wow. And there was this one, talking about the lessons of love, there was this one lesson of love that I got from him, from Phaedrus, but also my dad. So I did finally, after two years, the wood started getting developed. And I felt like if I can't run with him off the leash through these woods, you know, he's not really living a wolf life. And and then this uh, opportunity arose. There was a wolf sanctuary outside of D.C. that opened up. They had a female wolf that needed a mate. So I, I decided that I would um, give him away. And, you know, he had to get a vasectomy first. So I would visit him every couple months. So this was now two years after I'd given him away. And he was four years old. And this female wolf had been captured in the wild. And she really didn't like people. And um, so when I, I go to take him out for a walk, the person that ran the wolf sanctuary brought him out to me and I heard this growl and I just thought, okay, this growl is really for her. He's reaching more of this, um, his, his sort of prime power age and that, you know, she's older than him and she was kind of dominant. So, so I misinterpreted that. So I'm starting to pen, pet him and he's not welcoming my touch. Hmm. And I think, okay, maybe this growl was for me or something. I need to reassert my dominance. So I, you know, I stood like six feet away and, and stared down at him and, um, and I thought, okay, this would be good. And the person, Ruffin Harris, that was taking care of him was holding him on a leash. And as I'm staring down at him, his eyes glaze over. It's like he looks past me. And then there's this beautiful, incredible ripple that goes through his body, like he's tensing his muscles. And then all of a sudden, he just leaps at me. And he's coming at me. And he, he leaps so fast and so hard and he's so strong that he pulls the chain link out of the gloved hand of, of Ruffin, who's holding him. And he's coming right at me. Mm. And this was the way we used to wrestle. So this used to be fun. And, and so, but I thought, you know, he's stronger, older, bigger now, and, and this is, he's challenging me for dominance. So I, I tried to um, make it so that he couldn't bite me. And um, I pushed um, his jaw, but, but I didn't do it quite right. And so he got my wrist in his jaw and he's a few inches away from my eyes. He's sailing through the oh air boy. and he just squeezes my jaw and looks at me and then lets go. And he was like, I could have broken your jaw. I mean, your wrist, I could have broken your wrist, but um, I didn't. And, and so this was like a ritualized uh, struggle for dominance. And I realized that he's seeing me as another wolf and that, you know, I can't survive in these kind of ritualized battles with a real wolf. And so I, I, I was really sad. That meant that I could never be with him again.
Oh, wow. Because this was the, and so I was really sad that day. And I ended up calling my parents that night. And, and I said, this has been um, an end of an era, you know, that, mm. that, that he's really challenged me in ways that I can't defend myself. I mean, if I would have kept going, it might have ended up hurting me, but, but it didn't. And so I was just really sad and crying, and it was the big loss. And my dad was quiet for a while. And then he said, what's the problem? You did it to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, was like, oh, boy. <laughs> I was like, great. That it, it reframed everything. And I'm like, okay, he's his own wolf. I should be happy. He's independent. But um, well, I'll, 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 one last thing is that there is a, there was a young girl, Holly Pipple, who was uh, like 10 years old or something. And she was really good friends with, with Phaedrus. And we would go out and walks together and stuff. She later um, got a job with uh, Ted Turner and Jane Fonda on Ted Turner's ranch, taking care of their horses. And, Ted Turner, you know, has wolf packs on his land. And so just a couple of months ago, Holly and I have stayed in touch over all these years. That was 1975, 77. And we went out looking for wolves on uh, Ted Turner. So she's a nature photographer. And, and, and this wolf really impacted my life, her life, other people's lives. Um, it, it, and again, they're loving parents. They babysit for each other. And, um, and wrestling with him, it was just a privilege to um, have time with his spirit. With Phaedrus. Like yeah. Well, and, and oddly enough, flying, I flew home last night um, from Florida, of all places. Uh, and so I was watching this uh, documentary uh, called, and I love documentaries, and our regular listeners know that I talk a lot about documentaries, and um, that's my sort of my preferred entertainment. <clears throat> but I watched this one called Wildcat. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's, it was... It, it's it's worth watching because, and we're going to get into this uh, in, on this show. It's basically about a young boy, young kid who who um, was one of the youngest soldiers. He was British, one of the youngest soldiers to to be deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, and had massive PTSD, and and it just couldn't you know all the issues that you're uh, well aware of. Uh, so he ended up going down to a. Um, a non it worked for a nonprofit down in the Amazon where they were they would uh, they would take in uh, rescued animals you know whether they're tortoises or you know little squirrels or whatever and they ended up coming across this ocelot and, and an ocelot for those who don't know looks like a little like a little leopard right and uh, and and the, his connection to this ocelot which of course they they had to spend eighteen months they got them when he was one month old. Uh, I had to spend 18 months essentially raising him, bottle feeding him, you know, teach, taking him out on a lot, a lot, not dissimilar to what we just talked about, but taking him out on walks, teaching him how to hunt, teaching him which animals are, are safe and which animals react. And they have these little alligators down there and they have snakes, obviously, and they have worst, worst of all, they have poachers and, and loggers. Yeah. Um, but try, he had to try to teach him, uh, you know, so, how, how to be a, a, you know, a big boy ocelot. And it's, it's a very, very sad film. Not, not because at the end, the ocelot does go off. Um, but the trauma that this young guy is still very young. You, if you get to watch the show, mm. I highly recommend it. It is, uh, I, I've never been around um, PTSD like that, but it, it, the, the, the level that they went to sort of documenting this kid's journey and his struggles. Um, and, and there are moments that are wildly sweet and wildly, you sit there and you're like, okay, he's turned the corner. This is what he needed. Uh, they don't, those, those are fleeting moments. Mm -hmm. And, and so much of what, of course, your work um, has done is, is addressing this issue of, of PTSD and, and the stats are just staggering and you, you, you tell the stats better than anybody, but, you know, by, by best guess is, you know, 12 million people in this country yeah. suffer from PTSD um, a million of those are our veterans, um, and of course treated with what, what we've called so-called traditional therapy so far. And, and this has really been your alleyway. Of course, you've, you've had a long journey. I don't know. I think uh, best guesstimates 38 years, uh, that <laughs> well, you, it was, that, actually it was 50 years uh, ago. Well, when I was 18 years old, when I decided to focus my life on psychedelics, you know, MAPS is 1986, but I had a nonprofit in 84 to sue the DEA to keep MDMA therapy legal, which we won the case, but lost the 
where DEA rejected the recommendation of the judge. So basically it's been the, the 50 plus year journey. Yeah. So to speak. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I was so lot, curious yeah. going, going, going back to sound that, you know, I watched some other shows you did and this, co- this university that you went to down in Florida sounds like a really, I mean, for, you know, if any young kid uh, uh, watches these interviews that but their first choice might be Princeton or University of Texas or University of Colorado. I don't know, dude, after they hear about those stories, they might change their, their well, pick. Here's a sad story. You, you've been concerned about, uh, you know, some things that are happening in Texas. Um, in Florida, uh, Governor DeSantis has decided to kill the college that I went to. It's the Honors College of the state of Florida. It was an experimental school started in the 60s. I, I luckily went there when it was still a private school. So it was just an incredible environment. And, you know, just as one example, I, I did a lot of LSD and was confused. And I went to the guidance counselor at school and I said, help me integrate these psychedelic experiences. They're becoming more important to me than my classes. I think me and the world in general is overdeveloped intellectually and underdeveloped emotionally and spiritually. And how do I, you know, bring these things into balance in me? And, and this guidance counselor, instead of kicking me out of school or sending me to the police, he said, no, this is an important thing that you're doing. Hmm. Um, I'll help you. And here's this book to read. And it was by Stan Groff, the world's leading LSD researcher and theoretician. Um, you know, the book was not even published till 1975 and the guidance counselor had a manuscript copy directly from Stan. And so um, I got in touch with Stan in 1972 and took a workshop with him. And, and that's where I focused my life on psychedelics. But the school was supportive. And just um, a few weeks ago, Governor, Governor DeSantis uh, replaced the people on the board of trustees. He's trying to turn it. His model is a um, small Christian school. He wants to, it's, it's one of the most uh, gay rights friendly, um, you know, politically liberal schools in the country, certainly in Florida. And, and that's all he objects to. So right now, um, yeah, there's a, a existential struggle for a new college of Florida. Wow. And, and just so the listener knows, cause, uh, uh, I've heard you tell the story of the book. That book was realms of the human unconscious. Yes. Uh, yes. By Stanislav Grof, G R O F. Which was in, you wrote him a letter and he wrote you back and you went out and you hitchhiked out to see him. I mean, you, this was the journey, man. This was the lie. It's like, you, I don't know. Maybe this is a documentary. Yeah. But, well, there is a documentary um, that we're making about the behind the scenes stuff right. of, of what's going on. We've been working on it for seven years. and uh, But it's not to be released till after MDMA is a medicine. <laughs> And, and, and there, there, there's a book for people called Acid Test, um, LSD, Ecstasy, and the Power to Heal by Tom Schroeder. And it's about our work. And it's about the lives of uh, Michael Minhofer, the lead uh, psychiatrist, myself, and one of the veterans, Nick Blackston. And it is being, um, it has been optioned for a movie, um, but it won't be a documentary. It'll be kind of a Hollywood type movie if it ever gets really made, but it's, it's looking possible. So bring, bring me up to speed because so much has happened, it, it seems, just in the last few years. And again, <clears throat> whether we, we, we uh, dropped the pen 50 years ago or 38 years ago, but it really yeah. seems like, and I do think, and I've touched on this in other shows, and I'm, I'm, it is just high time that sti- the stigma around at least the conversation fades away, right? Whether that's, yes. you know, so, of course, psychedelics includes a lot of things we just... Um, um, decriminalize psilocybin here in the state of Colorado. Uh, but we're getting to this point where at least, you know, the, the, the light is back on, right. The shop is open. The conversation can be had. You can take a side. Um, but, but for the listener and, and for myself, like what is the latest in terms of clinical trials, FDA, I, I, you know, I know a lot about the space and I deal with a lot of companies that have to go through that process. It is, I mean, it's a slog. It's a marathon. Um, but what's, I, I feel like um, there's been a lot of progress just in the last two or three quarters. Oh, yes, there has been. All right. So I'll, I'll bring you all up to date. Uh, but, but I will say in terms of um, other aspects of progress, Tuesday night, I was on Fox News on uh, Kennedy uh, for business. <laughs> and, you know, not only is Fox News being positive about it, but she started out by telling me a story about somebody that she knew that had incredible healing from MDMA therapy. Hmm. You know, so we we really have done this um, bipartisan support. 
and and so there there's more uh, possibilities to be on Fox News to explain to people. But where we're at is there is um, on January fifth, uh, so just a couple of weeks ago, um, we put out a press release that we have finished our second phase three study, and that the results were uh, very successful and confirmed the results of our first phase three study. So for people to understand the, the FDA process, you, you first off do what are called preclinical studies, which are animal studies. You're looking at safety, toxicity, what it, what it might do in animals. You're trying to understand a little bit. And you have to do some of that before you can get into what are called phase one studies. So phase one are human clinical studies that are basically healthy volunteers looking at safety. Um, after that, phase two studies are small exploratory pilot studies with patients, and you're trying to refine your treatment. Who does it work for? What are your measures? Who gets included? Who gets excluded? And all of that is to design phase three studies, which are the randomized placebo-controlled double-blind studies that are used to prove uh, or hopefully to prove safety and efficacy in order to get permission to um, market these drugs as prescription medicines. So. We actually, from 1986, when I started MAPS to 1992, um, we had six protocols all rejected by the FDA. Hmm. Uh, and they, they had been blocking psychedelic research for decades. That changed in 1992 when they opened the door to psychedelic research. And we got permission for a phase one safety study with MDMA. I had previously done um, animal toxicity studies. That took us through the 90s. And then in 2000, we started doing the phase two pilot studies in Spain and Switzerland and Israel, yeah. Canada and the United States. And that took us um, 16 years. So 30 years from the time I started MAPS to uh, November 29th, uh, 2016, we had what's called the end of phase two meeting with FDA. And that's to, to try to get permission to move to phase three. And we did get permission. So we have now been basically six years in this phase three process. There, there are hundreds of psychedelic for-profit companies, um, we're the only ones that have um, completed any phase three studies. Right. Compass Pathways is just getting to start their first phase three study with psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. So our first phase three study was so successful that uh, we published it in Nature Medicine on May 10th, uh, 2021. We met all the requirements for being approved on the basis of one phase three study instead of two. So we applied to the FDA and they rejected that. They said, oh, it's new, it's experimental. We believe it, you know, you, you've definitely shown that it works, but we want more safety data. So the fact that we announced on January 5th that we have completed our second phase three study and we have an excellent safety record, we have excellent record of efficacy. What we're now trying to do is prepare the application to the FDA, which will be in the third quarter of this year. It's called the new drug application. Mm. And then it's going to take FDA six to eight months or so to review. And so we anticipate in the uh, second quarter of 2024, we should, if all goes well, should have FDA approval. Then because it's a controlled substance, it's also ecstasy, it's schedule one, the Drug Enforcement Administration has to reschedule. That'll take a maximum of 90 days. The states have to also reschedule. Around 25 automatically do it. The other 25, we go to the Board of Pharmacy. So we think by the end of 2024 that we will have MDMA available as a prescription medicine. And we also think that there's an excellent chance that it will be covered by insurance. That you know, people with PTSD have incredible um, cost to the system. Well, both personally for them, but also they live with high stress. They have panic attacks. They go to the emergency room. They have stress-related illnesses. There's often self-harm. There can be suicide attempts. It's, it's very um, expensive to, to society, to the medical care. So we, we do right. think we'll have um, insurance the, coverage. The, the, on the weight of the system. And, yeah. and, and, you, and you did a great job of, you know, certainly my mind works it, 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 in numbers, right? And stats yeah. And, yeah. And, and chances. And, you know, that goes all the way back to, you know, to being an athlete, what are, you know, it's all about numbers, right? And then yeah. being diagnosed, it's for, it's everybody's first question. What are my percentage and what's my chances? And in your TED talk, I, I thought you laid it out pretty good through these studies with, um, you know, men and women suffering from uh, just debilitating PTSD. I, I thought the stats in there were, yeah. you, you know, just as a dum-dum that sits here and goes, well, I don't know, I, I'm totally <laughs> neutral on this. 
uh, <clears throat> I'm going to wait to listen to this guy, but also being the dumb dumb that knows and, and focuses on numbers. I heard that and I was like, okay, well, I'm in. Right. And so just tell our audience uh, just how effective the therapy has been th- through the trials. Yeah. All right. So th- the first point is that we felt that we need to work with the hardest cases, mm. you know, the stigma over MDMA, the stigma over psychedelics. Um, so we work, the first phase three study was severe PTSD and PT- PTSD um, in this severe category is, is very um, debilitating. And we also decided that unlike many studies of um, PTSD, we would enroll people that have previously attempted suicide. Hmm. that we we needed to work again with the most, the people that are suffering the most. Um, We worked with people that had PTSD an average of 14 years, um, but one third of them had PTSD over 20 years. We actually had a Vietnam vet who had been stuck with PTSD for almost half a century and he was still able to get better. So we work with the most difficult cases. And we also, our operating philosophy was How do we get the best results? How do we optimize patient outcomes? We weren't thinking, you know, what's the minimum therapy that we can do to show just good enough results to get it approved by the FDA, at least cost, and then have insurance companies easily cover it. We thought, what is the best we can do? And so the best that we can do, you know, for most people is three MDMA sessions, one month apart. And these are eight hour sessions. And it's with a a co-therapy team. It's with two therapists, usually male, female, but not always. And there's 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions as well for preparation and integration. And again, the main point here is that it's therapy. It's not the drug. The therapy is what we're providing. The MDMA makes the therapy more effective, the same way with psilocybin or LSD. So that is our treatment. And what we do is we measure the results two months after the third experimental session. And the reason that that's two months is we, we want to see if the effects are durable. We don't want people right. to say, oh, that was a psychedelic afterglow. You know, they're doing great for a week or two after the MDMA, but now, you know, it fades over time. So, and, and the, the study compares people that get therapy with MDMA that people get therapy with inactive placebo. So it's basically therapy or therapy with MDMA. And there are methodological challenges. How do you do a double blind study? People can tell whether you've given them MDMA or not, you know, 90% plus of the time. All right. So in that context of the hardest cases, what we showed is that this two month follow up, the people that got the therapy without the MDMA, and these are people that have been through drugs for treatment of S, you know, SSRIs and other medicines, they've been through therapy. So what we showed is that Therapy only, 32% of the people no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD. So basically, one, almost one third of the people are able, who've been stuck with PTSD an average of 14 years, as I said, one third over 20 years, that in this kind of therapy, um, where the eight hour sessions, you're listening to music, you're having this inner experience, it's, it's not like going to a, a therapist for uh, a 50 minute hour, you know, once a week or something. It's very intensive. And, and we showed that this form of therapy where we support what's ever emerging, it's not a scripted therapy where it's not exercises that people have to do. We support what's ever emerging in the control group, 32% no longer are qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD. When you add MDMA, it goes to 67%. Wow. Two thirds no longer qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD. Another 21% had what's called clinically significant reductions of PTSD symptoms, hmm. meaning that they, their lives were changed. They had less symptoms. They still qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD, but over time, or if they could have gotten a fourth session, maybe they would no longer have PTSD. But we had what's called responders, 88% responders, 12% non-responders. So what that means is it doesn't work for everybody. There are challenges, but that for 88% of the people, their lives were better after the treatment. Now, we in phase two, um, we did a one-year follow-up. And what and when we don't have the data for the one-year follow-up yet for the first phase three study, but we'll have that data um, in a couple of weeks. But what, what we showed in phase two is that on average, people kept getting better and... The one-year follow-up was better than the two-month follow-up. 
wow. without any therapy from us, without any more MDMA. And, and because the basic idea is that we are trying to help people understand how to heal themselves how to deal with their own inner emotions that are often overwhelming, painful, frightening. But with the MDMA and with the therapy, people learn how to process and release these emotions. They learn how to recognize that the trauma is from in the past. It's not happening now. And they can keep helping themselves do that without the drug. So we're, it's unlike a traditional pharma company where um, here's an SSRI. We want you to take it every day. We want you to take it, you know, often for the rest of your life. If you take it, it just reduces symptoms. It cuts off highs. It cuts off lows. There's a lot of side effects. And if you stop it, often the problems come back. Our thing is, how do we get to the root of the problem, help you resolve it, and make it so that you don't need MDMA or therapy anymore unless you want to do it for other issues? So, so, so that is the, 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 so SSRIs, uh, that, that, that's uh, traditional therapy for PTSD. Yes. yes. That, and and I'm, I'm supposed, guessing that's the only therapy. Well, actually, no, because people throw also, I mean, doctors throw antipsychotics mm. to people that have, so there's a lot of what's called off-label prescriptions Got that, it. you know, the only drugs that are approved for PTSD right now by the FDA are Zoloft and Paxil, two SSRIs, but they'll, they'll, doctors will prescribe other SSRIs. They'll prescribe anti-anxiety medications, anti-psychotic medications. There's a great um, cartoon that was about um, a soldier who um, is, is like wading through a river and he's got his rifle above his head and he's holding it up, but he's actually wading through a river of pills. And these are the pills that have been given to veterans by the, the VA. And, and there are non-drug psychotherapies, prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy that do help a bunch of people, but they tend to be um, re-traumatizing for some people. So the VA just finished a study of non-drug psychotherapy with 900 veterans with cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure. And what they showed is that half the people in the study dropped out hmm. because they couldn't go through the therapy. The therapy was so painful to remember the trauma, to work with it. And, and that's where the MDMA comes in, that the MDMA can help make these emotions that are unmanageable or overwhelming and painful and frightening, they can help people process them. I'm just curious, you, you mentioned, and again, these, the sessions are eight hours long. There's, there's, uh, and, and there's a lot of this out there. I mean, it, it's, uh, um, in some of the documentaries there's, there's actually footage of this. Um, and, but you mentioned, mentioned music is, is this, yeah. and just out of curiosity, cause I've done a lot of this work and while I've never been to a war and I've, I've never, uh, uh, been sexually assaulted, uh, which is a lot of common causes for PTSD. Some of the most common, um, mm -hmm. you know, I've had a hell of a life and, and, and it only in the last few years have I decided, okay, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to war and I wasn't assaulted, but uh, some shit went down and, and I need to address it. And so, and, and we did a lot of work with music and, and, and a technique called brain spotting. Mm -hmm. uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but <clears throat> is the, is it just, I mean, does the patient walk in and they say, and you guys say, okay, put on your favorite music or is it specific yeah. music? Yeah. Um, it, it's curated music. Yeah. We, we want to use in almost all cases, but not every case music without words. So right. again, the, the idea is that the content emerges from the person and that we don't want to pre-program them by words, but, but the emotions, uh, caring in music are designed to give people energy or to calm them down. So of the eight hours, you take the MDMA, it takes about an hour to take effect. So the first hour, there's just a lot of stretching exercises or, or conversation. Where, where are people at? What, what are they currently feeling? Um, and near maybe half hour or so, 45 minutes, people start listening to music and it, it varies with every individual. And, the music and the eye shades, and you don't need eye shades. It's just people have this, once the MDMA takes effect, it's this incredible flow of thoughts, emotions, images, physical sensations. It's very metaphorical. It's very poetic. People are, are sort of telling themselves a story of their lives. Mm. It, it's not like dreams in the way, because it's often um, people's memory for the trauma is enhanced under MDMA because the fear is reduced uh, in the amygdala, the part of the brain MDMA reduces activity in the amygdala, but people's um, memories for the trauma is come back. And the role of the music is to um, 
prepare people in kind of a peaceful way. Then for like hour, you know, one to five or something, it's more energetic as people are, are working with things um, coming up. So it's, it's, uh, we like to use world music that people are not necessarily familiar with. Occasionally people will bring in some of their favorite music. Um, a lot of times people say, I'm done with the music. I just want quiet. I just want to be, you know, thinking about what's going on, feeling what's going on. You know, other times people are crying or shaking or they're, they're just letting out the energy that was trapped in them when they were traumatized. Um, you know, so that the, the, we find that um, we don't feel that it's necessary to have the same music for everybody, even though this is a clinical trial, you know, we, we have a standard therapeutic approach, but you know, we don't say you must say the same words at the same time. So the music is usually chosen by the therapists, um, discussed somewhat with the patient. Um, and then it's, um, it, it is very effective to, um, as, as we know, music can really bring us into a certain kind of emotional states. Right. And so it's well chosen to support what's going on. So when somebody's struggling, it's more energetic. When they're resolving something, it could be more peaceful. And so the therapists often um, have the music on headphones for the patient, but also on speakers in the room so right. that they're all in tune with each other. Right. Fascinating. Yeah. I don't, <clears throat> the, the type of music that we were messing around or using during my sessions was, was like bilateral, you know, so it was, it was. Mm -hmm changing sides. Yeah. And, and yeah that's, I I thought that, that's amazing. It's, Oh, it's, it's changed my life. Um, but in that in combo, uh, with the brain spotting, which is, is a little more technical to describe was, was it, it, it as it, when they tell you about it, you're like, what? I don't, <laughs> uh, that's not going to work. And, and boy, it knocked me out <clears throat> many times actually. You know, you, you make a really important point, or, or, or I just like to, to build on this, which is that when you have an MDMA experience, it's a human experience. And there are other ways to get to it, as you're saying, sometimes with music, sometimes with meditation. Mm -hmm. so it's not like, um, well, um, Sasha Shogun, the, the person that's really the underground, uh, the, the chemist that sort of rediscovered MDMA, he described his first experience with mescaline. And he said he realized that he wasn't having a, a mescaline experience. He was having a human experience that the mescaline helped them to have. Enhanced. So the same way that we see progress with the people that get therapy without MDMA, there are a lot of techniques to help people get into these um, states of mind and experiences. And the, the drugs can be helpful, but the goal is that uh, they help us do it without the drugs. And also that we don't say there's unique things that you can only get to with the drugs, but but with MDMA, a lot of times people do say, you know, with the music, with the context that I've never felt like this before, or I feel right. this self-love, I feel this peace, but it's something that's within you. It's, it's not an artificial thing coming from outside. So, and I think it's worth noting just because <clears throat> so many people are going to listen to this and, and, you know, doc, you, you were talking about a very specific um, um, type of therapy, very, obviously yeah. very accurate and specific uh, you know, uh, production of MDMA. And so there are going to be people that listen and say, <clears throat> and, 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 or, or kids or, you know, college kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and they say, this is great. You know, my, my mm -hmm. girlfriend last weekend at, at, at the concert said, Hey, do you want some MDMA? Or, you know, it's yeah, everywhere, yeah. right? Let's not kid ourselves. Yeah. In, whether you call it Molly or ecstasy, it doesn't matter. It is everywhere. <clears throat> and we are hearing about this in a very, very serious setting. So I just want to be really clear yeah. Yeah. And also ask you the question, because if somebody's like, well, hey, uh, I remember when I was, I'm just going to try this myself or, 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 you know, get some street version of, of yeah. this yeah. Uh, solution. Uh, I have to imagine that, that it's, it's a completely different experience. It can be, um, particularly if you approach it as a recreational drug, like I'll just want to have fun with it. And then when difficult stuff comes up, if you're like, oh, I'm just trying to have fun, people suppress it, and then they could be worse off. Right. Um, there are underground MDMA therapists, underground psychedelic therapists. So there's a lot of people that, that can find ways to do this in ways that are similar to the research. But I, I recently was in Mexico City, and I gave a talk to their Institute of Psychiatry, which is their equivalent of the National Institute of Mental Health. And one of the people there asked me this exact same question that you asked. And then he said that he was um, one of the 13 members in the world on the International Narcotic Control Board. 
Huh. This is appointed by the UN, different countries of the world, and they monitor compliance with international treaties. And he said that there's no barrier to making psychedelics into medicines in international law. But if they do become medicines, what are you going to say to all the people that might say, yeah, you know, it's not available right now. You know, I'm thinking of doing it. And I said, the, the, the first thing I want to tell people is that it's not in the drug. It's the therapy. It's the mm -hmm. context. That's what makes it healing, that you can take MDMA, you can take psilocybin, you can end up worse off, that the healing is in the therapy and the relationship that people have with the therapist in the context that they take it. You can have a supportive relationship with your friends who can support you and you can make an awful lot of progress, but, but don't think it's in the drug. It's in the context. It's in the safe setting. The second thing that I said, and we'll say to you now is that prohibition um, results in a lot of things that are sold that are not what they're supposed to be. Right. We, we, we had over a hundred thousand people die last year in America on uh, opiate overdoses. A lot of those were fentanyl. Right. We say people have gotten fentanyl mixed in ecstasy and people have died of course. From, from doing that. So it's, ter it's thing, terrifying. It, it, you just don't know what you're taking. Um, and then the, the third thing that, that I sort of want to say to people is think about um, prohibition and the drug war and why is it there? And it's an utter failure all over the world. And there's a growing bipartisan sense that it's never been about reducing drug abuse. It's been about persecuting minorities. Um, you know, the, the early first drug laws were against opium by the Chinese laborers that came to build the railroads. And then the railroads are done. Then we get these marijuana laws there against African-Americans and Mexicans. Absolutely. You know? yep. then, then the drug laws in the 60s, Nixon said, um, well, um, you know, John Erickman, his domestic pilot policy advisor, said that the two main enemies of the Nixon White House were the hippies and the civil rights movement. And you can't stop them from protesting, but you can criminalize the drugs they use and then bust them and break up their laws. So hence, that just that's how you got marijuana and LSD because of those two groups, marijuana and, you know, and by the way, this is <clears throat> Rick, not Rick's opinion. This is fact. This is, I've read this many, many years ago, that this was their, their uh, approach to sort of attacking the other side, you know, yeah. that the, the black community uh was with marijuana and, and the hippies were, you know, loved LSD. And so let's make them schedule one and they're fucked. Yeah. Yeah. Th yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think that, um, the main thing, you know, to tell people about it, you know, people could be suicidal and you can take MDMA and it could be helpful or it could make you worse off. Again, it's the context, it's the safety. So I'd encourage people who are considering whether to do it on their own to really read up and learn what they're doing, make sure that, there, there's one company licensed by the DEA in the entire United States that can take anonymous samples of drugs and tell you what they are. And they put it up on the internet so you can do it without risk. It's called Drug Detection Lab hmm. and it's in Sacramento. And there's the ecstasy pill testing program run by um, Dance Safe and uh, Arrowid, E R O W I D dot org, so that people can have their ecstasy pills tested. Sub subsidized in the costs. Um, but, but I do believe that we have a two track strategy. You know, the, the goal, long term goal is mass mental health. You know, humanity yep. is right. uh, endangering the planet. We're endangering other animals, nature. It, you know, it's a massive die off. There, there's an estimated to be a billion, potentially a billion climate refugees by 2050 mm -hmm. if, you know, climate change is not mitigated. And, and so, so I think stress is going to be increasing over the next couple of decades. Um, and so I, I think that there, there may be a lot of people that are thinking, um, yeah, I, I, I want to access this. And so we want this to be available as a medicine by trained therapists covered by insurance, but we also want to make uh, it available in a legal context post-prohibition. So that's why your questions are so important. And so I think to, to do this, ideally, you would have honest drug education, right. which we don't have right now. Right. We would have training and peer support. We, we, we have a program that we call Zendo Psychedelic Harm Reduction. We do this at festivals where people take psychedelics for recreational purposes. A lot of times stuff comes up and they don't know what to do with it and they're panicked and, and feeling terrible. If they go to the doctors, they could get tranquilized. They could get a label. So we want peer support. We want to ideally train 
hundreds of thousands, millions of people and peer support, how to help each other to have these experiences. We also believe that there should be, you know, drug checking, this checking, make sure that you know what you're getting and treatment on demand for people that want to have help if they feel that they've, um, you know, struggling with uh, dependence issues. So I think that right now the, the drug war is so damaging that legalizing immediately would be a good idea. It would be better, but we really do need to layer in all the, to, you know, honest drug education education and peer support, treatment on demand, peer drugs. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I was an early um, draft resistor to Vietnam. You know, I, I, I was, read that. Yeah, yeah I was not. Your, 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 your parents were worried you were going to be a felon and, and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, like hammering nails. Yeah, yeah. They, they were worried for, for a, a, you know, that, that's why being an underground psychedelic therapist at 18, I'm like, ah, I don't need a license for that. So that helped me sort of form my uh, life career. But, but I early on learned the difference between um, what's moral and what's legal. Mm. And, and so I think that, that when you ask about people self-medicating and, and stuff, I think it, it should be in this overall context of, you know, is this, are these laws that we should respect and follow or are these more um, laws that may not be wise? And, and may actually have been uh, put into place for uh, not the right motives. And, right. And, 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 yeah. No, I, I was I just, I want to go back to this thing about the therapist and, and, and what the next decade holds. I think I read that um, y'all's goal is to, is to train 25,000 therapists over the next decade. Obviously. Yes. Yeah. This is, a, this is complex work. It, it requires two therapists. So they're, you know, it kind of doubles everything. Um, and, and assuming things play out the way they're looking like they're going to play out and certainly hope, hope they, uh, they do, you know, we need, and, and we can get it, you know, or we don't need to get into all the demands on the healthcare system with doctors and nurses and therapists, but we're going to need people, right? Because yes, if you're, yes. if you're talking about 12 million PTSD patients in America alone, yeah. you are going to need, uh, this movement is going to need a lot of people, a lot of these uh, therapists that do very specific guided work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, well, and, and one of the things that we're just starting is going to be at the Portland, Oregon veterans administration, and it's going to be a group therapy study. Mm. And so all of the work that we've done um, so far has been in individual patients or it's in this cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy where there's uh, one person has PTSD it affects the relationship and both of them get MDMA in the, so it, it felt, and, and actually there's an incredible study that just started at a place called Sunstone Therapies in um, Rockville, Maryland, where it's cancer patients and their partners and both get MDMA. Hmm. So it's the cancer patient to deal with the fear of death. And it's the, the partner who's also engaged in these same emotional struggles. And so we're moving not just the individual therapy model, but to working with couples. And now we're also going to be exploring working with groups. Um, I personally think individual therapy will be more effective than anything, but, um, but, but, but we do need 25,000 therapists or, or more. And this, right. um, you know, and what we see from the pandemic is that there's greater increases in uh, depression, anxiety, suicidality, you know, things are right. uh, substance abuse. And, and I, I think if, depending on what goes on with climate change and, and, other factors, you know, there, there's likely to be a lot, a, a continual increase of struggles that people are going to have. Right. So and it's so, like we're headed towards a perfect storm. And, yeah, and, yeah. I, and so, these, these are yeah, hard but, things to talk about. Nobody, nobody likes to think about that reality. Um, but it, 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 you got to think about it. And did I, I also read, and, and I, 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 was, I had to scratch my eyes. I was like, uh, that MDMA was first invented by Merck in 1912. Is that a fact? That, or yes, I yes, make- yes, yes, yes. And in fact, uh, here, here's the amazing part. Um, so um, they were trying to evade a competitor's patent, and they, they just were trying to find a way to get to this other drug. And they um, had all these new synthetic pathways, and MDMA just happened to be one of the steps along the way. And so they patented it. They weren't looking for MDMA and they didn't do anything with it um, for um, about um, 15 years. And then they finally did some work in animals 
and they found nothing interesting. And they hmm. just said, okay, there's nothing interesting in this drug that we can see. The animals didn't say, oh, I feel more close to my fellow mouse. <laughs> you know, they, right. they, they, they didn't have the quite models. You know, now researchers at um, Johns Hopkins have given MDMA to octopuses. They've given MDMA to mice. They've given MDMA. We see a pro-social behavior in dogs in, in, in different ways, but, but Merck missed it. And the next we find is 1953, the Army Chemical Warfare Service is looking for mind control drugs. And they test eight drugs that are in a line um, in animals. And on one side was methamphetamine. On the other side is mescaline from uh, peyote. And in the middle was MDMA. And they're all what are called phenethylamines. They're all from the same class. So the way to understand MDMA, one way is it has the alerting properties of methamphetamine. MDMA is 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine. It's a unique molecule. It's not methamphetamine. But it has the alerting properties of methamphetamine without the uh, jittery aspects of it. And it has the psychedelic properties of mescaline without the visuals, without the uh, ego dissolution. And as a, as a combination, you can take MDMA, you can be peaceful, people use it in meditation or in therapy, you can deal it. So that, that study in 53 was classified. It wasn't released till the 70s. In the late 50s, Merck looks again at MDMA in animals and again decides there's nothing interesting. Hmm. And then it was this Sasha Shulgin who rediscovered it. He was looking for uh, drugs for therapy and drugs for spirituality and personal growth. And it started to be used as a therapy drug from the middle 70s to the early 80s. And it escaped from that community. Around half a million doses were used and it escaped and, and then it became ecstasy. And that's when it became criminalized. And then people figured out, yeah, they broke it down. You know, the yeah. smart party kids broke it down and figured out how to do it themselves or try to do it themselves. Yeah. And, and so a lot of people don't realize that it was a therapy drug before it was a party drug. Right. And yeah, so no, that's why I think it was important. I, I was so, uh, so shocked to see yeah, yeah. that, you know, 1912, that's a hundred, 111 years ago. Yeah. And when, cause we, when we're taught, we're having this conversation, thinking about this movement, you kind of have, you have to think about the whole history, right? And 111 yes. years ago is a long ass time ago and, and all of the steps along the way. And of course your brave work has really changed this, but this is, it, it's so many things, um, it, it, you know, and we can talk about whether it's, whether it's gambling or alcohol or mental health. I mean, there's this stigma that, and we're starting to see, at least in my view, the world change and, and go, oh, okay, well, I didn't look at it that way. That, that seems different. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that this, um, um, the fact that it's um, so old also means that it's in the public domain. Hmm. And so that's why we've approached it as a nonprofit, you know, initially. We, we have taken some investors recently. We're hoping to go the rest of the way with philanthropy. But the, the classic psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, they're all in the public domain. And what we're trying to do is to help people understand that it's the relationship that we have with these drugs that matter, that they're not good drugs or bad drugs inherently, that it's about the relationship. So you can take, as I said, MDMA in a therapeutic setting, you can be better. You can take MDMA in a recreational setting, not be in a safe place and end up worse off. So it, so I think the reinterpretation that people need to go through, and I'd say one of the main problems of the drug war is that it says, this is a bad drug. This is a good drug. You know, this is legal, but this, there's bad drugs and there, there's no such thing as a bad drug. It's the relationship that you have with it. The, the quintessential bad drug, according to the FDA was thalidomide. It was a drug given to women for morning sickness. It caused terrible birth defects. The only person from the FDA that ever won the Presidential Medal of Honor was this woman, Frances Kelsey, that blocked thalidomide from coming to the U.S. Hmm. Well, now thalidomide is a medicine and it's used for leprosy and certain kinds of cancer. It constricts blood vessels and they've done all these things to make sure no pregnant women get it. But now it's a good drug in a certain different context. So I think that's the, the main sort of policy idea is that it's the relationship and we've lost that. And, and the drug war is focused on the thing and not the relationship. Right. It's complex. So uh, have you struggled with 
you know, cause this is, uh, uh, and I'm sure you've, you know, look, we all have critics. I have more than most people. Um, <laughs> that's a fact you, between and you and me, between, between you and me, I'm, I'm, I'm winning, but you know, there could be folks that say, yeah, he's been at this a long time and uh, you know, now that, okay, this is going to get through, but is there a for-profit, you know, people question, is this, yeah. Is, yeah. is this really not God's work? But there's got to be some pot of gold at the end of the well, uh, of the Rick well, Doblin rainbow. Well, there's no pot of gold for me because I don't own anything. You know, right. it's, it's all a nonprofit. But um, what I learned um, in 2014, I, I thought when I started this in, in, again, 1986, that it's in the public domain. We didn't invent the idea of therapy with MDMA for PTSD. It was done before I even learned about MDMA. That's in the public domain. There's nothing really there to... Um, uh, patent, I thought that this would be immediately generic. What I learned in 2014, amazingly, after my PhD in 2001 from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard was on how to regulate psychedelics, I missed something completely, which was that in 1984, Ronald Reagan um, signed a law that provided incentives for developing drugs that are off patent. And the reason I didn't learn about it is pharma never does it. They always want patentable drugs, but it's called data exclusivity. And what that means is that um, if you make a drug into a medicine that's never been made before, no one can use your data for five years. Hmm. It, you don't have a patent. Somebody else can generate their own data. Um, so that's how it's different than a patent. And then if you do these pediatric studies that we have to do, if we succeed in adults, you get an additional six months of data exclusivity. That's five and a half years. It blocks the FDA from reviewing generic competitors till after the five and a half years is over. It takes them over two years on average, minimum six to nine months. So we'll, we'll, we should have six years plus of data exclusivity. And in Europe, it's 10 years. So I thought, aha, you know, there are so many different uses of MDMA. We've chosen PTSD, but social anxiety, end of life, uh, uh, alcohol uh, use disorders, uh, eating disorders, fibromyalgia, many, many things. And so if we were to continue to get money from donors, we would eventually exhaust these donors. Mm -hmm. And I realized that we're a, a, a nonprofit that's unique among nonprofits in that we're talking about a product at the end. We're trying to make a pharmaceutical medicine. And once I learned that there's this data exclusivity, then I thought, okay, there's a way where we can make a profit and then we can use those profits for additional research and for drug policy reform. So we created the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. And that is our for-profit pharmaceutical arm. And the, the thing about healthcare in America is that it's warped out of all good sense by the profit motive. Right. You know, we don't have national health insurance. We have the highest per capita expenses. Our outcomes are way low among the world averages. And so putting the profit motive first in healthcare, you know, we, we've seen recently about how Moderna is talking about uh, increasing the price of the, the COVID vaccine by four times or five times, you know? So there, there's a lot of concerns that people have about for-profit pharma. And there's a modification of capitalism called um, the benefit corp. And that's where you, it is for-profit, but you maximize public benefit, not profit. So we wanted to innovate psychedelic psychotherapy and also how to market a pharmaceutical. So MAPS is right now the 100% owner of the MAPS Public Benefit Corp. That's why there's no, I don't own anything, there's no private anything, but we are needing a large amount of money. And so to make it into three years from now, which is where we hit what we call sustainability, then the sales from MDMA will cover our expenses and then we get more money for more research and things like that. So we're at a crossroads that it's a very critical where over the next couple of months, we may need to, um, take in investors and sell equity. That's a possibility unless we can raise the money we need rest from philanthropy. And the investors that we've taken have what's called a royalty share, meaning they don't own stock. They don't have governance. They don't have board seats, but they have a um, share of our royalties. They have 3.85% or something right. of our North American royalties. So, so there is a for-profit aspect to this. And but that, that is, but, but this is that's very different than what <clears throat> certainly what I th I'm so glad you clarified that because yeah. and I, and and just for the record I, I haven't read that but I just cause in, in my yeah. mind was thinking well golly gee somebody could say this that it's I'm sure it's out there somewhere I didn't see it in my research um, but I'm glad you that that's that that's a very 
um, detailed uh, and complex answer to the question. Right. And, and, yes. and, and, yeah. and it's, you know, <clears throat> yeah. So the, the next couple of months for me is going to be spent, um, looking for donors. So we don't need to sell equity. Right. But people, anybody can donate, right? I was just, oh, I looked yeah. on this uh, in, yeah, yeah. maps. That's maps.org. If this yeah. is, yeah. and, 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 and probably, uh, the best spend your time learning a little more on the sites. I, it, it, there's a yeah. lot on there. Um, but if, if this, if, if this is compelling, certainly, uh, as a nonprofit there, there's that component that, that yeah. people can chip yeah. in. Yeah. And, and our new, um, sort of for a long time, our mission has been make MDMA into a medicine. Now that looks more like it's going to work. And so mm. our new kind of mission is a world of net zero trauma by mm. 2070. You know, so it's a long-term vision, but we would like to reduce the burden of trauma all over the world, particularly in countries where there's a lot of trauma, but not a lot of money. So, you know, we are um, trying to do work in, in Southern Africa and South Africa and Somaliland and Rwanda and, you know, Armenia. We're, we're trying to train Ukrainian therapists now. So, you know, th there's just an enormous burden of suffering. There's a hundred million plus displaced people in the world right now. So if we can have this net zero trauma by 2070, that's our new goal. And, and that is if we can be fully funded by philanthropy. If, we, if we're funded by investors, you know, a, a substantial portion of the profits will go back to the investors rather than to this mission. All right. I, I know you got to run, but I just want to have a little fun before you go. So as you're doing this net, net, what, what, net zero net trauma zero by, by 2070, and, and since you've seemingly been unstoppable for the last 50 years, <laughs> Well, how about a little spinoff, okay, please, that just ensures that you and me are here in 2070 to make sure we see it happen? If you don't mind, uh, that would well, be cool. Well, our mutual friend, uh, Peter Adia, is uh, you know interested in longevity. Right. Yeah, that's, and so maybe, he'll, he'll, maybe, maybe he'll be listening can, to this. Maybe we can do that. Um, I, I do want to just mention before we go that, that we're going to have the world's largest psychedelic conference ever. Um, we, we, we previously had the world's largest psychedelic conference in 2017 in Oakland. We called it psychedelic science. And there was 3000 people that came to that. This will be Denver 19th, June 19th to June 23rd at the Denver convention center. Um, people from all over the world are coming and we're hoping for, you know, eight to 10,000 people. Wow. And so if people are curious about psychedelics, um, this is the place to learn more about it. And so psychedelicscience.org, and it, it, there's information on our website, and we'd like to invite everybody. And, and we will have a couple days of experiential opportunities. We're trying to work with the holotropic breathwork, hyperventilation, uh, potentially um, ayahuasca ceremonies that are federally legal with the Santo Daimi religion, rape, which is a nicotine kind of snuff, um, meditation retreat. So it'll be experiential with support, and then... Um, lectures, conversation, for, and yeah. conversations and networking. But you know, it turns out that's just down the road from me. So I, yeah. I, I'll check my calendar. Thank you. Doc, this this has been, I'm so glad that, uh, that you agreed to come on here. I, I, I'm not bullshitting you. I've been following this. I've been tracking this. I know a, a lot of your longtime supporters and I, I just, man, I had so much um, res mad respect for, for just hanging in there. And, and you know, I can't, yeah. there must've been decades where people say, this guy's a, this guy's crazy. And, and well, he's there, a, there, there was that, but, but yeah. in my twenties, I had a dream that was the most important dream of my whole life. And the dream was of a Holocaust survivor, um, telling me to study psychedelics and the, 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 there's longer parts of the dream, but, but the main point was that if we can feel how we're all connected, we are fundamentally connected with everybody, with the, all with nature, with all the animals, you know, that there's this unit of mystical experience that psychedelics can help you have. And, and I felt that at this age 18, that this mystical, this sense of connection that the astronauts were talking about as they were going up to the moon and looking back on this earth and seeing it as one thing that if people can identify as part of this adventure, magnificent adventure of life, and that that's more who they are than their religion, their nationality, their gender, their sexual orientation, their socioeconomic status, that that can be the antidote to genocide, to racism, to environmental destruction. So it was this sort of political aspect of psychedelics 
that, that made me say, this is what I want to work on. Also the therapeutic aspect. So that's what's kept me going. So the persistence has been this message from this Holocaust survivor, you know, people have dehumanized us and, and therefore made it easier to kill us that, you know, if we can help people understand how we're all connected, um, that can be a contribution to mass mental health and to a better world. And so that, that's, what's kept me going the whole time. Wow. Well, it's worked. Uh, that, yeah. That's an, yeah. that's an amazing way to end. So Rick, yeah, thank you so much for your time. I'll, I'll see you. I'm sure, you know, yeah. I'll see you sooner than later. And, uh, Definitely. Um, and and uh, thank you for this opportunity to educate people because really the, the public education is critical now because the science is coming along, but the politics and the public education has blocked the science in the past. So we really need this public education. It's right. great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for your time, Doc.